Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 17th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I can ask members as usual and those others in attendance to sort out their mobile phones into the proper order, at least put them on silent. The first item on our agenda today is to decide to take whether we take item four in private. Are members agreed? agreed. Members are agreed. Thank you. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution on the Scotland Act 2012 and 2016 implementation reports. Uh, both the UK and Scottish governments are required to publish these reports on an annual basis, and it's expected we will discuss them with the UK Treasury Ministers later in the year. Okay. Cabinet Secretaries are accompanied today to, with two Scottish Government officials, Andrew Chapman, the Fiscal Responsibility Division, and Gerald Byrne from the Constitutional Policy Team. I, I warmly welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make an opening statement? A very brief opening statement, if I may, Convener, because I do welcome this opportunity to discuss the latest implementation reports for the 2012 and 2016 Acts. The focus of uh, these reports are the financial aspects of the bills, uh, but it's worth noting that nearly every power in the 2016 Act has now been legally commenced. Uh, progress is now being made in using these powers to deliver better outcomes for the people of Scotland. Some require considerable policy development work, naturally. Uh, some require extensive stakeholder consultation. Some require further primary legislation. So in different parts of the package of powers, uh, they're at different stages of delivery. Implementation of the most substantial and complex elements of the 2016 powers, tax and social security, are now well in a train. Changes in income tax rates and bans were approved by the Scottish Parliament in the spring. Uh, my ministerial colleague, Jean Freeman, leads on the new social security arrangements. Uh, we're committed to effective uh, working with the UK Government to ensure the responsible and seamless implementation of the 2016 Act powers. And the upcoming meeting of the Joint Exchequer Committee this summer will be the next opportunity to review progress with the Treasury. Parliamentary scrutiny has already been uh, proving crucial, and I fully recognise and welcome the important role that Parliament and committees play. I look forward to the conclusions of the Budget Process Review Group in supporting Parliament and its role in scrutinising the Scottish Budget, and most notably the first medium-term financial strategy that will be published shortly. I'm happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm sure, like members of the committee, you'll be <coughs> concerned in terms of identification of taxpayers that the HMRC are able to properly identify who is a Scottish taxpayer. And I'm aware of at least two MSPs who've received correspondence from HMRC informing them that they hadn't lived the majority of the tax year in Scotland. Apparently, this is because their address was being noted as being Great Britain instead of Scotland. Um, and if, be two, if two MSPs have identified that to me, I suspect that there, in Scotland there'll be a general, there'll be a significant number of people in that area, um, and unless they go back and challenge it, will that be changed? So I'm just slightly, I'm more than slightly concerned about. I'm concerned about it. That, so how confident are you, Cabinet Secretary, about HMRC's ability to identify properly Scottish taxpayers in that basis, and and you know, what impact that might have on your Scottish budget if this was proved to be? a more significant problem than just two of our MSP colleagues? Uh, well, convener, I think that's um, quite unfortunate if that is the case with two members of the Scottish Parliament. Of course, not knowing all the details, I couldn't comment on the specifics, uh, neither did I give uh, tax advice to colleagues, but absolutely it's a serious issue that HMRC is expected to provide robust systems to identify uh, Scottish rate taxpayers. I expect them to do that. We've got a service level agreement, but it is their responsibility. Um, what will be helpful, though, they are accountable to you as uh, the committee and to the parliament and to me as the finance secretary. They are expected to properly identify uh, taxpayers in Scotland. And, of course, the example you give of, of MSPs, um, it would strike me that all will be resident in Scotland and all should be paying, I would imagine, the Scottish rate of tax. So I would expect all MSPs uh, to be paying. So I think um, a further probing of those cases would be helpful but HMRC have given my civil servants the reassurance that they have programmes in place to properly identify everyone that should be paying tax uh, to, uh, for our purposes. What will help, though, is um, there is a project board that, that um, works through us holding HMRC to account for essentially their work streams in, in that, in that uh, regard, uh, and we'll, we'll probe that further. Um, but there will be more data, more than we've had before, because of the implementation of the uh, income tax powers. 
um, 16, 17 forward. So there'll be more data this summer, which will give us far more definitive data to fully probe this compared with the um, uh, some of the nature of forecasts we've had in, in the past. But yes, I would be slightly more concerned than I was before I entered the committee by the examples that you gave me, um, but I have been reassured by HMRC that they're doing everything possible to identify um, taxpayers as appropriate in Scotland, but it's certainly a matter we will pick up. And, convener, I would urge you to do the same in holding HMRC to account, as I will. Okay, obviously, I'll not disclose their names unless they give me permission to do so. Um, but how often are you getting that sort of update information from the HMRC on that sort of administrative and collection of the tax issues? Regularly, I can ask Andrew to cover the kind of um, technical interactions with HMRC, but I have to say it hasn't been flagged up to me that there is any systemic uh, concern about large swathes of people not uh, covered by um, uh, Scottish rate of income tax in Scotland it should be paying in Scotland. I mean, some of it, of course, is going to be down to the individual circumstances of taxpayers, where there might be dubiety about how much of the time is spent in Scotland or elsewhere or other um, personal finance matters. But largely speaking, I've been given enough to reassure me uh, that the figures were robust. Where there are examples, as you have just given, Kandina, uh, that require further, further probing, that needs to be done. And we have a whole assurance programme uh, to, to give us the confidence that the figures are correct. But the more definitive data we get, the better. Uh, and I, I recall last year's uh, question, I think it was from Mr Coffey, around the, uh, the difference in numbers between uh, our report and the UK government report in relation to income tax. It certainly hasn't happened this year, so that I think there is closer alignment, as you would expect, as we uh, roll out these new powers. Uh, convener, I didn't fully answer your other point, which was, you know, if the numbers, um, if, if HMRC was missing a, a lot of people, it would, of course, have a negative impact, notwithstanding the complexities of the fiscal framework and the relative nature of it all. But, of course, we want to ensure that every taxpayer that should be paying tax in Scotland is paying tax in Scotland, so it comes to us for investment in public services. I have no reason to believe that it's a substantial problem, but it's a, all the more reason to probe it based on any cases that can be raised where someone hasn't been identified. Andrew can maybe speak about the more regular contact that we have with HMRC. Yeah, sure, Cabinet Secretary. So just really to re re reiterate what the Cabinet Secretary uh, has already said, we have a joint project board with HMRC that meets on a quarterly basis. And part of the work of that board is to ensure that there are rigorous uh, data checks in place with regards to the identification and ongoing maintenance of uh, the system to identify Scottish income tax uh, payers. Uh, of course, though, we are in kind of regular, almost kind of daily contact with HMRC in order to ensure that the work that we need them to do is carried out on an effective and efficient uh, basis. And again, as the Cabinet Secretary alluded to, we will get the um, HMRC trust statement uh, this summer, which will for the first time provide uh, an outturn figure for 1617 Scottish rate of income tax receipts. As part of that report as well, we will get for the first time a definitive published figure as to how many Scottish income taxpayers um, there are. Um, of course, at the minute, our current estimate as 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 included in the report in Chapter 2, is uh, around 2.6 million. OK, James has got a question in a similar area. Yeah, um, I think it goes without saying that it's important that we've got uh, everybody who's a Scottish taxpayer recorded in the system in, in paying tax. Just to give a kind of practical example, if, if halfway through the year someone who lives and works in Newcastle um, decides to change their employment and move to Glasgow, working for a Glasgow-based firm and staying in Glasgow. How confident are you that HMRC have got processes in place to, to track changes like that and ensure that people will then pay their tax uh, in Scotland and into the Scottish pool? Yeah, I, I, I think we're fairly confident that if someone transfers in that kind of scenario, that that would be picked up in real time. So, although, of course, it, it depends how someone, of course, has been paid as well, whether it's PYE or whether they're doing their own uh, returns, um, will, will affect the, the, the time scales potentially. Uh, but if there's a change, someone's uh, finances aren't just locked in for you know the start of the year, for the whole financial year, but should change as the circumstances change and the, the uh, processes and work streams that we have. Uh, require HMRC to do that work. So, um, 
is, I'm as confident as I can be that, that that's all taken into account. Is that something that, I mean, that's a fairly simple example, but yeah. is that something that's been identified in the HMRC work streams? Uh, yeah, uh, I suppose uh, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, this is a, this is a matter for uh, HMRC, you know, to ensure that the person in question pays the correct rate of income tax, whether that be Scottish rate of income tax or the UK government's rate of income tax. And committee members will be aware that there is a long lag between the end of the tax year and the publication of outturn data. And part of the reason for that is that Scottish income tax is calculated on a liabilities basis. And, you know, the issues to which the member refers to are issues which, of course, need to be picked up in calculating the outturn figure and are addressed as, as part of that process. And that's why it takes so, you know, a lot longer than, for example, uh, the other uh, devolved taxes such as such as um, OETT and, um, and, and landfill tax. But essentially, is HMRC expected to proactively identify taxpayers paying to whether uh, as appropriate um, switch rate of uh, tax or not, yes, they are expected to be proactive in pursuing that, even when there's a change of circumstances, but, as you've described. Just to give us a bit of assurance, can you maybe just write to the committee just with the details as to how HMRC it, will Well, can that? We, I, I won't make this clear that I'm not HMRC, but no, what, what you want that. reassurance is that Scottish Government seeks the reassurance from HMRC, so we will absolutely do that. But I think there's a point here about committee holding HMRC to account as well as as for our function. I, I accept that. My concern is that I've raised a fairly simple example and although uh, both yourself and Mr Chapman have said that you're confident it will be picked up, I didn't really get any detail as to how it was going to be picked up. So uh, I would like but, some... But I can, can be, I'm making the point that I'm not HMRC. How they uh, conduct their yeah. operational uh, duty is, is, is partly for them to explain and for yeah, us to I, show I, that we're assured that. by that. I understand that, Cabinet Secretary but I think James is raising a reasonable point and he, he, he's in a, an expectation that the government will also mm. be doing its job to meet robustly with HMRC to mm. ensure that HMRC are going through a proper process to get the outcomes we expect. Yeah. There's nothing to stop us as a committee writing to HMRC and I, 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 I sense from where James is going we'll do that anyway. Mm. Um, but I think I think he raises a reasonable point for the government to address. Yeah, so. I, I just I absolutely accept that and I'll write to the committee on a, more of the information and assurance we have from HMRC I think I said at the outset, but I just want to make the point that we don't have operational control, but absolutely accountability point is well made. James, you wanted to ask a question about borrowing. Please feel right. free to do that now. And if okay, right. Uh, thanks a lot, convener. Just in terms of uh, capital borrowing, it's covered in paragraphs 82 to 83 of uh, your report. The, the, the note relates that uh, the interest rate in relation to 2018 is 2%. But I don't see anything in terms of the rate for 2017, in terms of the, you know, the drawdown on the £450 million of uh, borrowing. So I wondered if, if that was something you either had available or could provide to yeah. the committee. What page was that again? On your papers? Yeah, in terms of... Yeah. Scottish Government report, I think. A bit further picking up on the borrowing in the Scotland Reserve. 82 and 83 on. I mean, essentially, in terms of, it's a question around the um, the borrowing well, rate. Yeah, what I'm saying is, in paragraph 83, it says it's specific that the borrowing rate for 2018-19 is two percent. The previous paragraph discusses the the borrowing for 2017, 450 million pounds, which is the same, but it doesn't describe what the rate is. Yeah, it was 1.9 percent. Okay. Um, and just in terms of the repayment cycle, for 2017, it's been repaid over 25 years. That's right. And for 18, 19, it's been repaid over 10 years. That's is, right. Is there any particular reason for that difference? It, generally speaking, there's a kind of spirit of the agreement in the fiscal framework, but there's two reasons that uh, 25 years suited us in this instance. First of all, the nature of a uh, borrowing is to fund the whole capital programme, or contribute to the whole capital programme, rather than specific projects. But the nature of projects in the capital program is things like the fourth replacement crossing, trunk roads and, and other things, other substantial pieces of infrastructure which their life cycle is 25 years or more, uh, of course. So that um, cycle of borrowing fits with the, both the, 
the life cycle of the projects that will be part of the capital programme and rates, interest rates at the moment are low enough that it's in our interest to borrow over the longer period and lock those uh, figures in. Are you saying then in terms of 18, 19, the, the, the nature of the projects is different, which uh, drives you towards a 10-year cycle? It's um, generally speaking, we try and fit within the spirit of the fiscal framework. We were able to agree the 25-year period with Treasury. Um, we make the decisions on borrowing more at the, at the end of the financial year generally and how we draw that resource down and set out the agreements. Um, but we'll try and get as much as we can flexibility from Treasury. Um, but Andrew can say some more. But that was the essence for the, rather than the 10 years, the 25 years, yeah, the, the life cycle uh, nature of the projects plus the low interest rates. So if we can try and lock in low interest rates, clearly that's in the government's interest, try and maximise our spend and have as low interest on it as possible. Andrew, can you yeah, add to the course, one yeah. year to the next? Yes, yes, so it's precisely that. Um Cabinet Secretary. So uh, for uh, 17, uh, 18, we decide to borrow for 25 years based on two considerations. The first being that the assets in the capital programme um, matched that term length and that there are assets in the capital programme which have uh, lengths of lives of 25 years and more. So that's the first consideration. And the second consideration was precisely as the Cabinet Secretary alluded to, that historically interest rates are still, you know, kind of quite low. You know, 1.8, you know, 1.9% is a, is a good rate, historically speaking, and so we decided to borrow over the 25 years at this time to lock in that low interest rate. When it comes to 18, 19, um, yes, we included in the draft budget um, that the assumption would be repayment over 10 years. That is because there is this principle in the fiscal framework that the term length would usually be for 10 years. However, when the lives of the assets justify the term length being shorter or longer, we can make the case to Treasury to borrow over a longer or a shorter period of time. And as the Cabinet Secretary alludes to, later on in the financial year, we will um, take a decision on what borrowing we would like to draw down from Treasury and we will take into account the same considerations that we did last time, i.e. value for money and, you know, kind of what assets we would like to borrow against as part of our capital programme. When will you publish a list of assets that you're looking to match the borrowing against? Convener, I think in fairness that's largely covered in the already published infrastructure investment plan that I'm happy to provide to the committee as well as the context yes. of the um, uh, budget itself had some of the capital investment. Yeah. But, so, so the pipeline of projects is in the infrastructure investment plan. So it's a contribution to that programme. Check that through. Just one final question, Convener. Um, Previously, there was an issue around the change in uh, EU accounting rules, uh, which meant that um, capital projects had had to be included on the balance sheet, or certain capital projects had to be included in the balance sheet in full, and that restricted um, the, the borrowing powers. Is that is that issue still a live issue in relation to the borrowing that we've just been discussing? It's a very good question, Mr Kelly. It's still a live issue. It's still complex. Um, so there are a couple of different strands to it. Yes, those accounting rules still apply. The way we structure the NPD pipeline uh, in terms of how the projects uh, are delivered in terms of standalone projects, hub projects have different cla uh, classifications and definitions. Uh, therefore, um, uh, they, they can have different treatment. But in terms of the borrowing capacity, we did come to an arrangement with Treasury in earlier years as to how that would apply. So it was a notional capital figure rather than actual resources drawn down or um, a interest tied up. So it's still a live issue, and we have found a way to deliver MPD projects, I think they've described to the committee in the past, um, around as to how they are constructed. But it is still a live issue. Um, and any matter that is historic is accounted for in the, in the government's accounts. But the fundamental issue about <coughs> compliance with classification from uh, MPD programme is still uh, an issue, as was explained to the committee before, yes. Yeah, obviously the, the accounting convention is still in place. I, I, if I'm picking you up right, I think what you're saying is that you've found a way of reclassifying the projects <coughs> so for that it's not... It doesn't fall foul of that accounting convention, Correct. and therefore you're not therefore liable to include the full amount on the balance sheet. 
uh, appropriately, all legitimately and appropriately, yeah, yeah, I'm not uh, of course, uh, hub projects are treated differently from some of the larger standalone projects. And it's all down to um, uh, those matters of, of classification. But we don't face any of the, the current issues that we did previously when we had a resolution with Treasury. So we have found uh, a way forward, essentially. OK. I don't Thank you. I just wanted to ask one follow-up, um, if I may, on, the, on this um, use of the Scottish Government's credit card um, for funding infrastructure. I, I, is, you've maxed out the credit card. You've taken all 450 million that you're entitled to, and you've taken it all in the first year of the availability of this power. Have, have, you, done, have you done that in order to um, uh, finance the construction of new infrastructure, or to fund the maintenance of existing infrastructure, or both? It will all of the, the borrowing and all of the capital investment, CDL and everything else is going into the capital plan. And the capital plan, as I've described, infrastructure investment plan, will cover everything from the new projects, such as the Queen's Ferry Crossing, new NHS facilities, um, at the roads programme, for example, um, and estate enhancement. So it will be a mixture of um, new build projects, uh, new facilities, and maintaining that which we already have. That's the essence of any capital plan, is it not? And the borrowing capacity within that has funded, yes, to the tune of £450 million towards that overall capital plan. Can you give us transparency about the relationship between how much of that money is being used to build new infrastructure and how much of that money is being used to fund the maintenance of existing infrastructure? I can't disaggregate the £450 million from the overall capital budget because it's all contributing to the capital budget and it would be a totally academic exercise for me to say the £450 million borrowing power's capacity, which I think is widely regarded as a good thing that we're investing in infrastructure and the economy and NHS facilities and transport infrastructure, all the things that members ask us to do, but it would be an academic exercise for me to just draw out the £450 million figure and say, well, that funds just these projects, when the nature of the budgeting arrangements is that uh, between CDL borrowing uh, and other financial tools that invest in the overall capital programme. So I don't separate it out. OK, I don't think it's an academic exercise. I don't think academics should be used in that pejorative sense anyway, of course. But I, I don't think it's... <laughs> I hold them in the highest regard, I Professor. Think, I, don't, I, I don't think it's an academic exercise, Cabinet Secretary, for the reason that there is... It seems to me that there is a difference, a material difference and an important difference between Scotland investing in new infrastructure that we need to grow the economy and Scotland using its new borrowing powers, the Scottish Government using its new borrowing powers to maintain existing infrastructure. Um, one is investment properly understood. The other is you know, you know, using capital investment funds, using capital borrowing really to maintain existing uh, roads, existing hospitals, whatever it is that you're doing with this money. We don't know what you're doing with this money because you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not telling us. Um, so, it seems to us, it's, so it seems to me for those reasons that it's not, nothing like an academic exercise. It's really quite important for us as a finance committee to understand at some level of detail and specific, specificity what you as Cabinet Secretary for Finance are doing with the um, uh, with the you know uh, with the full 100 percent um, uh, availability of the of the borrowing that you've that you've taken out in the first year of the availability of these powers. And see when you answer that question, tell us what the overall scale of the infrastructure programme amounts to at the same time. So it gives us a perspective of where the 450 million lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I mean some of this is expressed in the overall budget that we've debated. Um, I, I would I would um, not. Uh, I would not accept the characterisation at all from Mr. Tompkins or the, or the suggestion that I was uh, suggesting that I wasn't uh, treating academics with respect. I was simply making the point it would be an academic exercise. It would be assignment for a strange purpose for me to just say that this bit of the capital budget um, uh, input borrowing powers is paying for these particular projects when I've described that all of the capital investment input is contributing to all of the uh, capital projects rather than assigning one a uh, funding stream necessarily with one particular project where that's appropriate is revenue financed uh, capital projects as I've described through the NPD uh, pipeline. Uh, I think it's also uh, not the case that I haven't explained this to Parliament. It's expressed in the budget. It's expressed in the a infrastructure investment plan and it's expressed in government outturn reports and the government's accounts as to how we use um, uh, resources. 
uh, and, and all of that's absolutely uh, transparent and upfront. Uh, I, think, I think the distinction between new build and uh, maintenance um, is a false one because clearly we have to maintain what we've got. Now, whether that's infrastructure in the state, uh, transport, uh, housing, whatever it happens to be, maintenance is, is, to, is, is singularly important because it's also good for the economy as well, not just the new projects, but the new projects as they're required uh, are a success story, whether it's a substantial fourth road crossing, a uh, hospital investment, and then the projects that we've committed to in the budget. In the 1819 budget, there's substantial investment earmarked for housing on a multi-year basis. Uh, uh, transition to a low carbon economy, uh, energy efficiency, and in due course we uh, will commit uh, in terms of the digital enhancement to the tune of £600 million for the procurement of digital connectivity as well, ongoing transport programmes and the enhancement of uh, the estate. All of this has been expressed, indeed debated by Parliament. I think it's important as well in this um, economic cycle and and yes with the economic challenges we face that we invest in the economy through that infrastructure spend um, including the transition to a low carbon economy so i think that investment is necessary it's to be encouraged and, and indeed all members of the chamber including those in the opposition normally demand more from our capital spend not less and and really make that distinction between new build and maintaining what we've got because both are absolutely crucial in uh, delivering the new infrastructure that the country requires and also will prepare us for a, an even stronger future such as digital and maintaining what we've got. Recognising that we do have substantial legacy issues as well in terms of the condition of the estate and other issues that have to be addressed in terms of uh, adaptation. Uh, in terms of the overall um, figure on infrastructure spend, uh, the committee will be aware that it is um, it's substantial. It's between three and four billion pounds in terms of the capital programme and the interventions that we make. 450 million pounds is significant. Um, as part of that, with the low interest rates, uh, that has allowed us to do more uh, in the economy and to deliver the commitments of the government, indeed, uh, through the budget process and of Parliament um, as well. But we are delivering it in a prudent and a balanced way, but one that's trying to stimulate the economy. And on that, I thought we were all agreed. Alexander, I think we're moving in a slightly direct, different direction now into ADT issues. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, moving to uh, departure tax. Um, in paragraph 21 of the Scottish Government report, it mentions the deferral uh, of ADT until issues can be resolved. Uh, but the report doesn't say what progress has been made in resolving these issues, uh, nor whether an estimated date for ADT uh, is available. Uh, so can the Cabinet Secretary say? It's, 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 it's a very good uh, uh, question because it's still a live issue. Um, uh, the report wa was accurate at the point it was published. I still engage with Treasury ministers. Uh, no resolution has yet been found. Principally, of course, this is about the Highlands and Islands exemption issue, whereas if we implement the tax right now without a, a resolution to that, first of all, we have defective de de devolution. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the, the, the no detriment principle would, would apply because it'll be detrimental to um, uh, the country, but for Highlands and Islands, they'd have to pay that tax, air passenger duty, UK equivalent, for the first time, um, and uh, HIAL, the, the airports organisation for that part of the country, say that that would be calamitous uh, for that part of the country, uh, as well as unhelpful uh, in terms of administration, uh, but there is no resolution to the Highlands and Islands exemption issue. The reason we can't uh, uh, proceed is, uh, in our view, that uh, that uh, devolution is defective until that issue is resolved. Only the UK government can resolve that because they're the member state, because this fundamentally is a state aid compliance issue. Scottish Parliament can't act in a fashion contrary to EU law. Um, it does raise the question mark over the um, compliance of UK government, but ultimately they're the member state. Therefore, I have worked with Treasury. I think I'm on to my third or fourth minister equivalent in UK government dealing with this issue. Uh, in fairness, I think they want to try and find a resolution to this issue, but it is largely their responsibility to resolve it so that we can have the successful transfer of the power to Scotland so that we can enact the policies that the Parliament sees fit in that regard. It is a live issue. Clearly, Revenue Scotland would be collecting the tax. Clearly, the sector does want 
certainty and a forward look. So I am making further efforts to get a resolution with Treasury, uh, but intend to uh, update the committee within the next few weeks um, if I haven't established any further progress. So, so would you expect a resolution straight after the Brexit date? Uh, well, that's also a good question. If, if Mr Burnett can explain to, to anyone in the United Kingdom what the arrangements are going to look like uh, post-Brexit in the spring of 2019, uh, then he's in a better position than, than most of the UK government, never mind anyone else. So we can't say at this point, because we don't know what state aid compliance is going to look like. We don't know what the Open Skies Agreement uh, might look like if we are a, not part of any European agreement. We want as much certainty as possible. The committee is well versed on the Scottish Government's position in relation to the EU. But no, it's not as simple to say if we uh, leave the European Union in uh, the, the spring of 2019, this resolves the problem because there will still have to be some form of compliance in uh, trade agreements and uh, aviation agreements. Therefore, Brexit is not the answer to this one, but clarity from the UK government very well could be. Uh, thank you. I know other colleagues want to come in on the subject. So. Has it been covered or do you want to still come at Ash? Yeah, please. Thanks, convener. Um, some of the ground that I wanted to cover has been addressed already. So I'll just ask you, um, in point 22 of your report on the same subject, um, it says here, Revenue Scotland has conducted a programme close down exercise and communi communicated a high level startup plan to the government. I'm just I'm uh, interested in this startup plan. Is that publicly available? Specifically in relation to air departure tax, it, when it became clear that there was a problem, um, the, there was no point then proceeding to prepare to collect the tax naturally. So in terms of that, I'll ask Revenue Scotland to provide the committee with more information. Um, they, they, they would clearly want as much um, a warning as possible when the power can be switched on. But as I say, it's hard for me to give that clarity right now as it stands because we don't have the resolution with UK government. But I think in fairness, the sector will want certainty. Revenue Scotland needs proper notice to be able to enact it. And I can get further information uh, to the committee from Revenue Scotland on what their processes look like. Uh, but as I say, it's my intention to return uh, to the committee by way of information if I don't have any more progress from the UK government imminently. Thank you. Okay, um, Patrick, you had some supplementary on this area, and just, other, just ask your other questions okay. while you're there as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, just on, on ADT, it's nearly four years, getting on for four years since it was agreed that this should be devolved. It's, I think, over two years since the legislation was passed and the, the snagging issues still aren't resolved. Is it fair to assume that it's not going to be resolved this year? I, I, I honestly, in all honesty, can't answer the question because the resolution is not in my hands. What I have committed to do, I've engaged with Treasury as constructively as I can, um, successive Treasury ministers. Um, I've set out the position of the Scottish Government, what our expectations are. Uh, the further action I'm taking, though, is to uh, establish a, a working group with key interests in Scotland uh, to look further at the issue to see are there any other resolutions in a Scottish context that can be delivered without compromising the devolution of powers. So we'll be doing further work on it, but um, I will require the UK Government to resolve that uh, effective devolution before I could honestly answer the question about when it will be resolved. Would it be reasonable to suggest that the government could use that quite extended delay that there is in implementing the devolution of this power uh, to develop a policy that's based on an evidence base that doesn't fall over like the last one did? Um, Mr Harvey will be well aware he made um, a number of requests to government around independent assessments that I accepted uh, and were published. It does show the environmental impact, it also shows the economic impact. It was independent of those with a, a, an interest in the, in the tax rate for the purpose of, of government and parliamentary scrutiny. I think that was helpful. Um, so I think we've provided far more substantial information. I make the point, of course, there is the matter of um, how the Parliament and the Government chooses to use the power if we had it. I should say that the Government still supports the principle of uh, air departure tax uh, reduction. Um, I accept that there would require to be environmental uh, mitigation, but we do still believe that it would be good for the economy. However, I will not compromise 
the nature of the devolution agreement and take these devolution powers in a defective state, introduce the tax for the first time in the Highlands of Islands, which would be a calamitous decision for that part of the economy that is dependent on uh, aviation uh, transport and other forms of transport, clearly, uh, and compromise uh, the finances of, 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 of that tax uh, in trying to deliver a resolution to it. So I'm working as constructively as I can with the sector, with communities affected, uh, and also with UK government. But this is a problem uh, of UK government's making, and I require them to provide a resolution to it. OK. Uh, two, two questions I wanted to ask about uncertainty in, in general, uh, moving away from ADT specifically and, and uh, looking at the, the, the wider picture. One, one example of the uncertainty that exists is around the potential for uh, behavioural change uh, in response to income tax policy. Uh, we've, we've heard that the, the range of, uh, uh, of, of predictions or, or views about that range from the, the ap apocalyptic uh, to uh, simply ignoring the, the, the challenge and, and pretending that it's, it's not going to be an issue at all. Is the government itself collecting any data or undertaking any work to gauge the extent or nature of behavioural change, uh, or is it entirely leaving that to the Commission? It, of course, that's fundamental. Well, first of all, is of course, we do work, we do modelling, we do analysis of our own. The chief economic advisor, you would expect to do that um, kind of work. We also take advice from the Council of Economic Advisors um, as well. The issue of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, of course, is that essentially, um, by law, by, by statute, statute, we are guided by their numbers. The drawdown that I can have from Treasury is dependent on their numbers. So I am bound to use their uh, numbers. Uh, but there is challenge with civil servants on method, well, not, constructive challenge and challenge meetings on methodology, on understanding, on the figures that are being used so that both civil servants and economists can fully understand it. Um, and SFC is independent, but there is that nature of challenge so we can be as well informed as possible as to what we think about their forecasts. The position we, the position we took on, um, on income tax uh, based on, on their work, because the drawdown is, is based on their forecasts uh, and their figures, um, we uh, will we'll clearly look very closely at that. Um, but on this issue, the, the forecasting issue is, of course, incredibly complex and difficult. But when we come to an outturn, it will tell us much, much more on what we need to know on the actuality of that. And in that regard, I think we can do more probing of both HMRC uh, and SFC, who will do the forecasting, but HMRC in terms of what the actual outturn was. And that will be able to tell us much more on what actually happened in behavioural uh, change as opposed to what people think might happen. Sure. Th this is this is what I'm what I'm kind of getting towards is the there is a, a, a commitment which I think you've you've made in the in the chamber and elsewhere on several occasions now to return to multi year budgeting spending reviews that uh, that take a, a longer term look ahead um, the reconciliation uh, with, uh, between the income tax uh, forecasts and uh, uh, the, the the impact that will have on the the Scottish budget for future years is one area of uncertainty. There are a range of other uncertainties which are unavoidable. It's, I'm, I'm not criticising the, the, the fact that those are uncertainties exist. They're, they're unavoidable. But to what extent is there a, a, a challenge and how are you addressing that challenge in returning to multi-year budgeting, which many people have made the case for for a long time, when these new forms of uncertainty exist uh, about the the resources that will be available to the Scottish Government? It, well, I'm first of all delighted that Mr Harvey is not criticising, and neither should he, uh, or, 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 or other members who were on the Smith Commission in, in giving me the fiscal framework in which I operate, which is incredibly complex. A pleasure and a joy as Finance Secretary, uh, but incredibly complex, as we all uh, understand. Uh, the, the question is a very fair one. I actually agree with um, the, the, the desire. Uh, to have multi-year funding uh, uh, in as much as, as we can. We've been able to do it on things like early learning and childcare, housing investment and other capital projects. Why? Because it makes more sense to give multi-year certainty in that regard. And that's capital. And that's partly because UK government spending review has given us longer sight of the capital period. Uh, resource, we're going into last year in resource from UK government figures. They have committed to a multi-year spending review um, we should know the 
uh, conclusions of that, uh, in, uh, although they will set out uh, the UK budget later in the year, uh, but in spring of next year they should set out the uh, spending uh, review. Um, I'll set out much more of this, uh, scenarios and the planning as the committee has asked me to do in the medium term financial strategy uh, by the end of May. So that will set out a lot of this information. Uh, but in principle, uh, I understand and agree with the desire to have uh, multi-year settlements uh, published, notwithstanding the complexity and the variabilities and the determinants that are subject to such change, including forecasts uh, and, and other matters um, uh, within uh, the fiscal framework, the economy generally, Brexit uncertainty, you know, caveating it with all of that, in principle, uh, I would like us to be able to return to multi-year uh, settlements going forward. And of course, the, the not insignificant matter of parliamentary arithmetic means that I still have to come to Parliament every year to secure consensus to pass a budget every year. So there is that a, a, a determinant as well a, a, into the mix um, a, as well. But I think I'll be able to see much more in the medium term financial strategy to be published on the 31st of May. Thank you. OK. Um, Murdo. OK. Thank you, Convener. Um, Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I wanted to ask you something that's in your paper uh, about the question of the Scotland-specific economic shock, uh, which has got a very specific uh, definition, as you will know. This is where uh, Scottish onshore GDP is below 1% in absolute terms on a rolling four-quarter basis, and Scottish GDP is one percentage below UK GDP growth over the same period. And that, uh, in terms of the fiscal framework, has particular consequences and triggers um, what's known as a Scotland-specific economic shock, which then unlocks additional borrowing powers for the uh, Scottish Government. Uh, now, as far as I can determine uh, from what's in the paper, the, 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 the for earliest trigger point for this has not yet uh, been passed. But if we look at previous data for um, 2017, if we take the four quarters of 2017 going on the Scottish Government's published data. For that period, Scottish GDP grew at 0.7535%, and the UK figure for the equivalent period was 1.7848%, which means there's a gap of more than 1%, and uh, Scottish uh, GDP was, for those quarter, four quarters, below uh, 1% in absolute terms. So looking at the four quarters of 2017, it does appear that that would have generated a Scotland-specific economic shock. Am I right in that analysis? Can I ask Andrew to cover yeah, that? Of course. Um, so uh, there is a paper annexed to our report uh, covering um, this precise question, uh, Mr. Fraser. So uh, as you'll be aware, um, the borrowing powers were uh, updated as part of the Scotland Act 16, including the resource borrowing powers. Those new powers commenced on the uh, 1st of April 2017. So at, at the minute, we do not have um, four rolling quarters of outturn data from April 2017 onwards. So we cannot access the additional flexibilities associated with the Scotland specific economic shock borrowing powers. That would be the first thing I would say. And the second thing would be that... Um, uh, paragraph 66 of the fiscal framework provides that we would be able to borrow in the event of a forecast uh, shortfall in tax receipts uh, at current. We, um, we, we, we don't really have a forecast shortfall to, to borrow against. So at present, we cannot use um, these powers because we are not in a defined Scotland specific economic shock as defined in the annex of this of this um, paper, but this is, of course, something we'll be monitoring closely uh, going forward. Yeah, no, no thank you, and, and th thank you for that explanation, and, and it does does confirm you know, what I was driving at, which is that technically these provisions don't apply as yet, but looking at the historic data, if we went back to the four quarters of 2017, we would have met the criteria had this applied at that point. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Uh, yes, and there are other... Um, I suppose, uh, points as well um, with, uh, over the past 20 years in which that has been the case and that went into formulating the, the provisions that we've got in the fiscal framework to account for these situations in which uh, the Scottish Government needs to manage um, uh, you know, increasing volatility uh, with respect to tax receipts not being forecast as we expected. 
Okay, thank you. And I, I, I think there's really a question for the Cabinet Secretary. We were, we were discussing with Mr. Tompkins a, a few moments ago the question of economic challenges. I mean, clearly it's an economic challenge for the Scottish economy if we're facing something that's defined as a Scotland-specific economic shock. W what does that say about your government's stewardship of the Scottish economy, that that's what we might be facing? I would pose the question, what does it say about both governments' role in the economy of Scotland? I don't see how the UK government gets to walk away from any responsibility in Scotland's economy uh, when the UK government is mishandling the Brexit negotiations, is in control of migration policy that's a key driver in terms of population and productivity, sets the block grant to Scotland, and even our tax powers, where we do have some fiscal freedom, is all relative to what the UK government chooses to do. In addition to that, the UK government, of course, manages macro economic policy and does have a role to play and has played that role in part in industrial and economic interventions uh, in Scotland. So I've touched on some of the negatives, um, but clearly it's for both governments to focus on economic success in Scotland, not helped by some of those factors, but the Scottish Government set out uh, a range of economic strategies. I would challenge the uh, members to name which strategies we, we should no longer have, but they reflect the, the nature of Scotland's economy and the interventions that we know we need to make. And some of what I was touching upon earlier in relation to Mr Tompkins' question about capital investment is we have to prepare Scotland's economy for the future. So yes, that's transport investment, that's digital investment. Uh, clearly, it's housing investment, it's transition to a low-carbon economy and a high-tech economy as well. So some of the elements of the Scottish Government's budget to improve our economic position is about research and development, attracting more foreign direct investment, to upskill more of the workforce, to invest in innovation, to expand on exports, to expand on intelligent industrialisation, such as the new Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, uh, to incentivise uh, new business and property growth through the business rate system, non-domestic rates, growth accelerator policies. I could go on, but I can see Murdo Fraser doesn't want to hear me give a list of our economic policies and interventions, but it's clearly expressed that we recognise as a challenge in Scotland's economy. It is for both governments to take this seriously, UK government in terms of their responsibilities, and we'll do everything we can in terms of our responsibilities, which incidentally also means a responsible and balanced tax regime uh, that supports uh, the economy, uh, which is a key power that's come from the uh, Scotland Act um, itself. So, some of the structural uh, divergence uh, that there has been is down to issues such as the oil and gas downturn, clearly, eh, offshore, eh, with onshore impact, and there are signs of eh, recovery there. But all the more reason to allow our economy to diversify and to have the kind of eh, impacts that we know will give us economic success, and not least population growth. The government doesn't control in Scotland population growth and migration, but clearly the actions of the UK government are making that much harder eh, in that context. And yes, even though Brexit may well be happening to the whole of the UK, it is having a disproportionate effect in Scotland, and that is a serious threat to this country's economy, and we can see it being evidenced right now in that divergence in economic performance. So in the face of that austerity, eh, Brexit mishandling, and inadequate uh, measures in terms of the challenges that Scotland face from the UK government, the Scottish government is doing all we can to grow our economy and put us on a stronger financial footing. I hope that answers the question. Well, that's a, a very lengthy answer, Cabinet Secretary, completely absolving yourself of any responsibility for the performance of the Scottish economy. The, what undermines your argument totally is that the fact that this is defined specifically as a Scotland-specific economic shock. If this was down to Brexit, we see the impact applying across the whole United Kingdom. The fact that this is Scotland-specific suggests there are problems being made at home here in Scotland, which is the responsibility of your government. Isn't it time you started taking responsibility rather than passing the buck? You see, um, this government is making the necessary financial interventions that are required to help grow our economy in Scotland an attractive place to live, work and invest. And in the face of Tory cuts, we've been investing more in resource, turning austerity into real terms growth of Scotland's budget through the responsible use of our tax powers. So we are actually making the interventions. The biggest increase in any portfolio in the Scottish Government in budget year 1819 was the economy portfolio with an increase of some 64%. 
with uh, substantial funding in high on for education, innovation, business support, and a range of uh, schemes to support uh, the entrepreneurial culture. But in terms of the, um, the Scottish divergence, I think I was trying to characterise that some of that, and this is evidenced by work that Fraser of Allender Institute and others have done that shows that some of the most successful economies in the world are those who have had population growth. The Scottish Government doesn't control the necessary levers to affect positively that population growth. In terms of Brexit, our analysis on the threat and the impact of Brexit is having is disproportionately affecting Scotland and UK government leaked reports have since vindicated what we were saying on the impact and the threat of Brexit. So I would argue, yes, Mr Fraser, both governments have responsibility here and we are doing everything we can to grow the economy in the face of Tory austerity, mishandling of the Brexit position and misunderstanding the true economic nature of Scotland and they should, as we do, accept our responsibility in doing more for the Scottish uh, economy. I would say one final point, just one final point, it's an important one, Kavina, because this characterisation that compares Scotland with London and the South East is not a fair one. When you look at all the data that exists, Scotland is performing relatively well in compared to the other nations and regions of the United Kingdom. And on right. that basis, then we know uh, that Scotland has strong economic foundations, but it's the UK government need to take some responsibility for their current handling of our economic position. I'm moving this on. Ivan. Thank you. Um, change the direction um, back slightly. Commentation, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I want to talk about VAT um, and, and just to clarify my understanding of, of what's going to happen when the, the devolution of the VAT assignment um, takes place. So there'll be a forecast of what we think VAT receipts in Scotland are going to be. But then after the fact, there won't be a, an outturn number as such. What there will be is a calculation which will be an estimate based on survey data of what we think VAT receipts in Scotland might have been or were, but won't actually have any hard reported outturn data. So what we will be doing then is through the reconciliation process is comparing what we forecast with the estimate of what we think it was. Is that correct? That, that's a very fair characterisation. Yeah. It's forecast leading to survey data. I, I want to be really open with committee in this regard. I'm not yet satisfied that we have the VAT proposition in the shape that we want it to be. It hasn't been agreed yet, and I think we've got more work to do for us to be totally satisfied that the methodology and the timescale is right for us, and I just want to be open with committee on that. I, 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 so there are principles I accept that it would be difficult and unwelcome for the business community to have a separate um, a tax uh, collection administrative system for VAT in Scotland, so that was the other extreme. So if we are basing it on surveys, we want surveys to be as robust as possible, and what's proposed is far more robust than what's existed before. Uh, but there is the complexity of forecast. But I do want to make sure that we get the methodology right, because it is only assignment, it's not a new power. The, the VAT issue is just assignment, so I want to make sure it's absolutely right for Scotland before we sign up to it or it becomes a, a, a self-defeating exercise. You know, it's interesting to hear. I suppose there's, there's kind of two directions I was wanting to go then. The first was to explore a bit more around about why you think it would be difficult to collect real data. Because at the end of the day, HMRC is collecting VAT returns from companies. Those companies are either in Scotland or they're in the rest of the UK. Those companies know in terms of their input and their output, VAT, whether it's coming from consumers or businesses in Scotland or in the UK. And if you do have VAT return at the moment, you actually have to identify separately um, how much of your um, revenue and spend is, uh, is, is EU um, or, or not um, at the moment. So th there is a kind of framework there. And I just wonder how much you had explored what that system would look like were we to collect real Scottish VAT data from businesses, because th the reality is that cross-border businesses that are selling to consumers or businesses across the UK are big enough and well organised enough to know that data anyway, because their business model relies on them understanding very well what they're selling to who and 
how much they're selling it for. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, on advice, uh, it wouldn't be welcomed by businesses uh, in terms of administration. I totally get the point about, um, for some it's quite simple already, just pay the VT and then it would be for the administrator uh, in terms of um, uh, UK government agencies uh, to set that out. But there would be a lot of grey areas where companies in Scotland or that operate in Scotland wouldn't necessarily be sure as to where to allocate that amount. GERS, of course, is, is only um, an estimate and assignation. I think that's partly why I, I'm saying I'm not totally satisfied yet on this issue, because I am a bit nervous about, um, depending on forecasts, the survey data and reconciling that. But what I've seen so far suggests that um, uh, separating it out for Scottish businesses adds a complexity and a cost that would be unwelcome. Now, I'm happy to go and come back to the committee with more information on that, but this is also a live issue. Now, there are timescales set out uh, in terms of when methodology should be produced and when it should be implemented, reflecting, of course, that one year was a transitional year with no budget impact, leading to uh, a year with impact. But I want to be absolutely sure that we've got the foundations, the benchmarks and the methodology right so that it's as accurate as possible to reflect what is really happening in the Scottish economy uh, in terms of VAT assignment. It, it, it is frustrating though that, that it is only uh, assignment uh, rather than a power to be able to vary the rate in the, maybe the way that the Parliament would want us to do for particular functions. No, I understand. And, and I suppose that leads me to the second part and you've kind of partly answered that already. At least you've got an open mind on that which is for, for one of more, more, um, more um, the fine language, if we're going to be kind of dancing around about two made-up numbers, then what is the value in the proposition if we're going to be comparing an estimate with an estimate or a forecast with an estimate yeah. and trying to reconcile in that space? Is there, is there a cleaner way to do this that, that doesn't that, involve going yeah. down that kind of pretendy uh, process? That, that's, it, of course, the joy of doing the Scottish budget at the moment on income tax, <laughs> which is a, a substantial figure. But, but have least, term data you, you, get up, tax you get to a won't. point in reality yeah. and what tax was actually yeah. paid, ultimately an outcome exactly. that's absolutely yes. correct, which we never quite get to with the current proposition in VAT. Yeah. Let me be clear, though, I am not proposing in my exploration of the issue a new complexity, a new cost, a new burden for business. What I want to be reassured about is that we can make the figures as accurate as possible so it truly reflects as best we can what VAT has been accrued in Scotland and therefore what should appropriately be coming to Scotland, uh, the Scottish budget, uh, in that regard. And I, I do think we need some more work on that before we sign up to it. Okay, thank okay. you. Just take that a wee bit further because you're, you're obviously sending a, a bit of a, a warning that this isn't isn't where the Scottish Government want it yet in terms of the information that will be available through the survey process. My understanding is that the the fiscal framework agreement was that this would be implemented uh, and the assignment would be implemented in 1920, but there would be a, a transition period. Uh, has that transition period been agreed? Because uh, obviously if we haven't got this right, that transition period might have to last a bit longer than was originally expected to do some testing on these numbers to make sure we've got some robust figures before we implement anything that might potentially be difficult. Uh, Convener, that's a fair characterisation. What I'm doing as Finance Secretary is making sure that the methodology, the numbers and the estimates are as accurate as possible. Because this is assignation, it's really important we get this right. We, we can't exercise the power, so we're just signing up to an assignation for a figure to come to the Scottish Budget. So I want to make sure that that figure is right and accurate for Scotland. The timescales you've outlined are correct, that agree the methodology, have that transitional year, assess the data, and then implementation, i.e. impact on Scotland's budget. Um, so I want to probe this further. I have a meeting with the Joint Exchequer Committee in the summer, but I'm not signing up to this until I'm satisfied it's right for Scotland. I think the survey data is far better than what existed before. Uh, it has more, it'll have more information, it covers more households, and it has the right range of products. I'm not challenging the essence of the methodology, but I just want to be assured that it's robust enough to accurately reflect what is being spent and therefore accrued in VAT in Scotland. Uh, now, there is a agreement coming from uh, Scotland Act, fiscal framework, subsequent engagement I've had with Treasury on a range of financial matters. Clearly, we can revisit um, the technical agreements if we've got good reason to do so. And I think if there's any question about the methodology or the estimates or the reconciliation, then it's right to get the agreement 
correct in the outset rather than uh, further down the line on this issue. So that's why I'm treading carefully on this one. But, but what effectively you're saying, though, is if there's no agreement, the transitional period could be extended to make sure that, that all that data, in terms of its robustness, can be shown to be robust. Yes, if, I, if I'm not convinced, I think it'd be a reasonable proposition to ask that the transitional period be extended to get more data to get it right, as opposed to implement something we were not satisfied by. And I, I assume committee would, would understand that approach if that's what transpires. Okay. Well, obviously, we've had a, a, a separate briefing from your officials on the VAT issue, and they were going to come back to us. But obviously, we, we, we have the Treasury coming to the committee sometime in the, the autumn, September. Uh, and I, I think we'd like a, an update from the government before we get there to enable us to be in a position to properly have that evidence session um, constructed around the Treasury when they arrive. Um, Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, um, I wanted to ask about the audit and accountability framework, uh, the draft of which we saw and considered at, at, at this committee. You, you can see how important a robust framework will be to allow us to scrutinise HMRC and people like that, particularly in relation to the issue that was raised earlier about identifying Scottish taxpayers. It was just to simply ask you, where are we with that? And I note that in both papers it says it will be agreed between ministers, Scottish and UK ministers, and to ask you for an assurance that this committee's wishes that that process be as simple, simplified as possible uh, be taken on board and framework that we'll see. OK, it's not been agreed by ministers. It's not been agreed for the simple reason that there's an issue with another committee in Parliament. I think the Audit Committee he wants greater access and, and doesn't, as you, you have expressed as well, Mr Covey, you don't like the, the, the process of having to go through Scottish Government to hold other agencies, particularly the UK agencies, to account. You want the direct accountability. I agree with that proposition, therefore I've not signed up to uh, the current framework in that regard. Um, now, that's not just my view. I think the uh, Public Audit Committee in Scottish Parliament has made that point. I think they had a hearing in February and came to that conclusion. Therefore, I am trying to help parliamentary committees and get more out of transparency and audit and accountability direct from the agencies that are delivering um, Scotland Act implementation powers, I suppose. So I'm supporting committees and not signing up to the agreement until that's resolved. If that's resolved, then I'll sign up to the agreement. Okay. 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 Neil. Okay. Um, just want to ask you uh, about um, the transfer of the British Transport Police. Um, the annual report from the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, notes the Scottish Government delayed the transfer of British Transport Police to Police Scotland from 1st of April 2019, but um, I didn't see any mention of this in, in, in your report. Um, you'll be aware the Justice Committee have recently identified uh, additional significant costs in relation to the merger and the transfer of staff. Um, given it's not in, in your report, I think it would be helpful for you. The Finance Secretary could tell us to what extent uh, the Scottish Government believes there are uh, problems, including financial, with the transfer of British Transport Police? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say in this. My report covers that. That's right, the, the financial provisions coming from the Act, largely, and of course, um, uh, between the uh, Justice Secretary and the Transport Minister, um, they work on this issue. But it's my understanding that the Joint Programme Board overseeing the integration uh, agreed to review the timetable on advice from Police Scotland, BTP Authority, that operational aspects of integration should not be ready for April 2019. So it won't have a financial impact that I can quantify until that review has been complete and taken into account what Parliament has said about the issue and all the engagement with stakeholders. I'll be in a stronger position once we have uh, that plan uh, going forward. But clearly the government has uh, reviewed its position uh, in terms of integration in light of um, uh, views expressed. And their financial issues as part of that, being considered as part of that review, the financial implications of the transfer? Uh, they they would do. They, they would do, yeah. yeah. And I to say, because of that um, uh, review, I haven't expressed it in this implementation report, um, implementation report because it talks about the, the legal commencement, then the uh, financial consequences where, where that applies, but it hasn't applied yet. Okay. I think it would be helpful to get more detail on that when, when it's... When it's and and will be shaped by what the plan is, which is subject to consultation at the moment. Okay, I thank the witnesses for being here this morning. Um, I now close this uh, public part of the meeting and we'll take the next item in private. And thank you again to our witnesses for their contribution.